right, so this is part three of chapter 10. We're going to talk about hearing and um, olfaction and gustation or taste. So I'll start with hearing. So first of all, we just want to talk about the nature of sound waves. So sound waves are mechanical waves and they're caused by air molecules being put into motion by a vibration of some sort, like something's vibrating and pushing onto the air um, molecules. And the air molecules are, um, there's alternating compression and rarefication. So compressed air, air molecules are close together. And then right after the compression, there is an area, a rarefied air, where air molecules are farther apart. And what this does is it creates sound waves and our ears can pick up this um, compressive sound wave and translate that into electrical signals. And so we're looking at um, the nature of waves here and we're just seeing that, you know, wavelengths, we have a couple properties of sounds. We want to talk about the loudness. So how loud a sound is, it's going to be the amplitude of a wave. So how uh, high the wave is like this. And then that's measured in decibels and pitch or the frequency is going to be measured in Hertz and the pitch is going to be um, how close together or the, the size of the wavelength, right? So again, a wavelength is from peak to peak or you can measure a wavelength from trough to trough. So higher pitches have closer wavelengths. So small wavelength is a high pitch, okay? And then a loud ampli a higher amplitude equals louder. All right, so let's talk about how we can amplify those sound waves and make them into electrical signals in the ear. So first of all, um, the sound waves are going to enter into the ear through the external auditory meatus, and they're going to vibrate the tympanic membrane. The vibrations of the tympanic membrane are going to be um, passed on to the ossicles of the middle ear. So the middle ear. Um, is air filled, right? It's filled as air. And the um, remembering from anatomy that the air pressure in the middle ear and the air pressure in the external ear have to be the same so that the tympanic membrane can vibrate properly. Um, if you go up in an airplane or are diving and you have a change in air pressure between the middle ear and the external ear, then you can open up the eustachian tube and the eustachian tube can equalize the air pressure. So you open up the eustachian tube with a yawn or you can swallow or open your mouth really largely and that can force open the eustachian tube. So this air filled space of the uh, middle ear has the malleus, incus and stapes. So these ossicles are going to vibrate. So first the tympanic membrane vibrates, passes those vibrations onto the malleus which is attached to the tympanic membrane the malleus passes those vibrations to the incus and the incus passage vibrations to the stapes. So overall amplification is about 20 times when it reaches the oval window. So the foot plate of the stapes contacts the oval window and that is going to contact the, um, the inner ear, which is gonna, so the cochlea is the part of the inner ear that's for hearing. And um, so the vibrations from the oval window will be passed into the fluid inside the cochlea. Um, and so this is how we can get the vibrations in the air changing to vibrations in the fluid. And the fluid of the cochlea is going to then depress um, the organ of hearing and the mechanoreceptors of the ear and translate those into electrical signals. All right, so let's take a look at um, the cochlea. So functional anatomy of the cochlea. Um, there are three different ducts in the cochlea. And so for my anatomy class, um, the anatomy textbook has different terms than the physiology textbook, but I'm gonna go ahead and use the um, anatomy textbook terms because they're simpler. Um, so what we have are three ducts. Um, the duct where the sound waves are gonna enter into the cochlea is called the vestibular duct. So your physical, your sorry, physiology textbook calls it the scala vestibuli. Um, so either term you should know, but I usually will say vestibular duct. So the vestibular duct is filled with a fluid called perilymph. And then you can see how the perilymph is filled here. We reach the end called the helicotrema of the cochlea and then it's continuous with the lower duct. This lower duct is called the scala tympani or 
um, tympanic duct. Okay, and the tympanic duct ends at something called the round window. So the round window is an elastic membrane that allows the compressive force. So if you're compressing and pushing like a plunger in a toilet, right? If you're pushing in uh, one direction on a container that's filled with fluid, if this was a very rigid structure, the round window, there's nowhere for that fluid to move, right? You can push on the fluid, but the fluid's not gonna give. But the round window is elastic, so every time you push in with the um, stapes, you can actually have a little bit of compressive force go out. So this round window is to alleviate those um, fluid waves as they are exiting the cochlea. Um, so then the third duct inside the cochlea is sandwiched between the um, vestibular duct and the tympanic duct, by the way, these are both filled with perilymph, is the, um, called the cochlear duct, um, but your book calls it the scala media. Okay, so this is also the same as cochlear duct. And this is gonna be filled with a different um, substance called endolymph, which is gonna be different than perilymph with the um, ion concentration. And I want you especially to know that potassium ions are very high here, so a lot of potassium ions. So um, this is the um, organ of hearing. So this is the um, spiral organ of cordy, or we call it the organ of cordy. And the organ of cordy is going to be between the two larger ducts, so the vestibular duct and the tympanic duct, which are both filled with perilymph. This scala media or the cochlear duct is filled with endolymph and here right we have this little square here this is our sense organ the organ of cordy and so we can see that the organ of cordy has is sandwiched between two membranes so i want to go back and show you oh, look at this picture so if we follow the pink lines sound waves in the ear canal so these are areas of compression and rarefaction so they are going to vibrate the tympanic membrane, vibrate the ossicles. The ossicles will vibrate the oval window. I mean, the stapes will. And we can see how those sound waves will come in and depress this upper membrane of this uh, middle duct, the cochlear duct. Now that m upper membrane that I just colored in, that's the vestibular membrane, okay? So the vestibular membrane is going to get deformed and depending on the pitch of the sound wave that's coming in, it's going to land on different areas of the cochlea. So that's why we see some sound waves coming here, another sound wave landing here. But we can see wherever those sound waves land on the vestibular membrane, it's going to deform and compress the vestibular membrane. And that's going to push all that fluid down. It's also going to compress and deform this bottom membrane, which is the basilar membrane. Okay, so you want to know those two membranes. And then in the center, there is a third membrane called the tectorial membrane. The tectorial membrane does not deform as much. It's rather stiff. And the hair cells, which we can see here, right, the hair cells have very long stereocilia that are going to be bound to or touch this tectorial membrane. So when sound waves travel through the ear, they first enter into the perilymph of the vestibular duct. They're gonna deform the vestibular membrane along the cochlea according to the pitch, right? So it turns out that high frequency um, wavelengths here will die out early and hit the um, cochlea closer to the oval window, whereas lower pitch um, sounds will depress the, the vestibular membrane farther away from the oval window. And that is going to then deform the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane will also get compressed. And the tectorial membrane, so the basilar membrane has these hair cells on it. And as the hair cells are bouncing up and down with the basilar membrane, the basilar membrane is going to go up and down, they're going, the stereocilia are going to get moved. So they're going to get compressed and bent um, with the bending and deformation of the membranes here. So let's take a look at exactly what happens when you bend those stereocilia. So notice that we have at rest, we have a partially depolarized hair cell. 
right? And we have the some calcium ions ch channels open, some not. We have a little bit of um, calcium leaking in. We have a little bit of um, uh, neurotransmitter released. However, um, when you have dep or like sorry, when you have the hair cells bent in the direction of the tallest stereocilia. So stereocilia are oriented short to tall. And when you have movement in the direction of the tallest stereocilia, you can see here that there's little protein um, anchoring bridges, like anchoring bridges between the stereocilia. And so when one of them moves, they all kind of move together. And in this position, you're putting the highest amount of tension. Um, this is gonna be tight and it's gonna open up those potassium channels. So those potassium channels are mechanically gated, right? The mechanical stress of pushing those hairs, those stereocilia um, off to one side are going to open up those potassium channels. So they're mechanically gated potassium channels and they're gonna be more likely to open um, in this position where you're moving towards, you're bending the stereocilia towards the longest one. Okay, so bending in the direction of the tall stereocilia, you'll open those channels and you'll cause a much greater depolarization that is going to cause a lot of calcium coming in and a greater amount of neurotransmitter secreted. Um, so this, this hair cell will then uh, communicate with the afferent neuron here and to send action potentials, right? And so you can get more frequent action potentials. If the stereocilia are bent in the opposite direction of the long one, these uh, protein, um, proteins become slack and they're going to, um, basically those mechanically gated potassium channels will close, right? Because they're not, it's in the opposite direction of what forces them open. So they're gonna close, you're gonna get a hyperpolarization inside the cell and you're not gonna send um, those action potentials, okay? so. Basically, that's the function of the organ of Cordy, right? So it's that mechanical stress acting on those hair cells. And the reason why we wanna know there's potassium here, right? So the endolymph is very rich in potassium, and that's why we have all those potassium ions um, surrounding the stereocilia of your hair cells. Okay, so again, just to look at the coding for loudness and also for pitch. The location of the hair cell bending along the cochlea will code for fre the frequency or the pitch. So you can see again that this is a high frequency sound, so a high pitch. High pitches have high hertz, right? Uh, high frequency. And then as we go into a lower frequency um, near the helicotrema, we can see that we have depression of our vestibular membrane and basilar membrane farther away. So the location on where you compress the, um, or, you, or you activate the stereocilia of those hair cells is gonna be interpreted in the brain as different pitches, right? And so you can think of this, I saw a really pretty picture once of the cochlea, basically just a, um, a piano keyboard, right? If you just rolled up a piano keyboard um, in a spiral, you basically have the ear. So you can have like different pitches depending on what key you hit. And also, of course, if you're listening to music, you have all different kinds of pitches at one time. Um, and so you can compress different areas of the cochlea at once. And then loudness, oh, I don't have it, but the loudness is gonna be the degree. So how much um, of the um, hair, hair bending is going to be put together as loudness, right? So the brain knows the action potentials from a neuron or from a particular region of the cochlea, which will be interpreted for a certain pitch, and the frequency of action potentials will determine how loud it is. So the more action potentials you have will determine the loudness. This is gonna be maybe a quieter one, okay? All right, so um, let's look at the pathway for sound. Oh, I don't have a picture, but um, so we have hair cells are gonna be the receptor cells and they're modified neurons. Right, so these are your hair cells or modified receptor cells. They're going to synapse on an afferent neuron. These afferent neurons are gonna form the cochlear nerve. The cochlear nerve. And the cochlear nerve is going to go into the brainstem, synapse with the second order neuron, and that second order neuron will go to the thalamus because that's where all 
uh, senses are, are going to relay, and then from the thalamus to the temporal lobe to uh, interpret what you're hearing. All right, so let's talk about equilibrium. Um, so the ear is also responsible for your sense of your um, the sense of motion, which way you're moving, um, and also balance, and that you know gives to your sense of balance. So let's talk about the semicircular canals. And this is going to give you the sense of rotational equilibrium or your basically how your body is moving um, when it's rotating. There are three of these uh, semicircular canals oriented perpendicular to each other. Um, so you can think of them as the XYZ axis. The anterior canal is going to move, detect movement up and down. So you can see how it's oriented up and down. The lateral canal detects movement from side to side, lateral. So you can see this is more side to side. And then the posterior canal detects um, head moving up and down and to the side. So they're all gonna have um, a special sort of range of motion in each canal. And then when you're moving, um, the three different canals will be stim stimulated in different amounts. Um, and that can be interpreted for a, you know, a comp an angular movement. Um, so let's look at the receptor cells. So inside the semicircular canal, you have an area, this enlarged area uh, called the ampulla. So the ampulla is an enlarged base. And then you have um, this word cristae, which is gonna be the basically where your hair cells are embedded along with a lot of your um, support cells. The hair cells are going to have stereocilia, but then they're going to have a really, really long one, a specialized one called the kinocilium. And then all of the stereocilia and the kinocilium you can see are embedded in a cupula, which is a gelatinous material. And when you turn your head, the um, cristae and the bone, right, your, that stays, uh, that's going to move with the movement of your head. But the fluid inside, right, the endolymph that's inside the semicircular canal is actually stays kind of still. So the fluid is what sort of creates like a wall and, or forces the hair cells to bend when your head moves. Um, so anyways, our, you, as your head rotates, the canal is also going to rotate, right? The, um, but the fluid is actually going to stay relatively stationary. So the canal with the hair cells uh, move and the endolymph does not. And so the stationary aspect of the fluid is gonna cause tugging and pulling on these hair cells and that will cause the action potential to eventually signal that we're have, having movement in that one direction, right? So it work very much the same as your hearing. Um, so it's a mechanically, oh, it's a mechanoreceptor. Okay, so you have these specialized hair cells and they're going to synapse with the afferent um, vestibular nerve. All right, then we have our, so here basically is a picture of, right, the at rest or a constant rate of motion, we have a few action potentials just telling your brain that your hair, your head is still in that one spot. Um, if you have an acceleration, you rotate the head, you have pressure from the endolymph. So this, your, this part is actually going to move, but the endolymph is relatively, it's going to move, but not as fast. And so it moves slower. And so it's going to create a barrier. It's going to bend those stereocilia um, and the same thing in the other direction. So um, depending on the direction, you can have um, a few action potentials or many, many action potentials. All right, so if you look at the utricle and saccule, these are two areas in the inner ear for linear acceleration or for um, static um, or head position. So um, what I hear was changing position, anterior, posterior, or superior, inferior. Basically, if you're in a car and then you, your car starts to go, right, you have a forward acceleration and you can feel that because of your utricle and saccule, or if you're jumping up and down, you can feel that movement motion because you're, um, of your saccule. So the utricle is actually the one that's for your horizontal plane, and then so horizontal plane, and then the saccule is for the um, vertical plane. So same kind of um, 
you know, same kind of uh, orientation with the kinocilium, the longest one. Then you have stereocilia oriented short to tall. We have a hair cell that's associated to afferent vestibular nerves. Some support cells. We have a gelatinous material that uh, the stereocilia are embedded in. But there's something new here. We have otoliths. So otoliths literally mean hair stones and they are calcium carbonate crystals and they're going to help weigh down the gel. So because we're not having a, a motion or the, you know inertia to help move fluid around, we were sort of just um, telling the, the brain that your head is in one position or looking down. So you basically need this otolith to make it heavier and to help deform the stereocilia when there's not like momentum backing it. So um, yeah, so in here um, you can see that we have um, the hair cells upright and then we have acceleration which bends the hair cell in one direction and then we have backward acceleration with hair bends the hair cell in the other direction. So your brain gets you know the message um, in each direction different kinds of information so you know if you're moving forward or if you're moving backwards. And then if you're just moving the head uh, in one position, right, if you're just the tilt of the head, um, it's the same kind of thing where you're just, the, the uh, otoliths will help weigh down the gel and then you'll get a change in action potential depending. So it's not important to know all the small details of that, but this is just basically how your utricle and sac will work. Okay, so there are, um, this flow chart just shows you how we have a lot of input to the vestibular system. Um, we have our vestibular afferents, so the signals, you know, the neurons coming straight from our inner ear, so from our utricle and our saccule. And then we have other sensory systems, so our eyes, for example, right, and our body will also tell you um, if you're moving or not. Um, and so the these all feed into the vestibular nuclei of your brain stem and so this can tell your cerebellum what position you're in this is going to help balance an equilibrium um, it's also going to give you a perception in the higher parts of your brain the cortex and it's also going to inform where you're going to put your eyes um, and this is also something that you know when you talk about being motion sick seasick air sick that there is some incongruency here with the um, inputs. So your vestibular system is telling you know your brainstem one thing, but your sensory system is telling them something else. So your eyes might be seeing that you're not moving, but your vestibular system says you are moving. Your body might be saying that you are moving as well, but your eyes are not. So one of the um, nice things about, or not nice things, but one of the things you can do about motion sickness is try to have all your senses agree. So to have your eyes look at something in motion and have it agree with how your body is moving and that might alleviate motion sickness. All right, so moving on to our last couple of sensa uh, sensory um, organs, we have taste. So taste buds are gonna be located on the bumps of your tongue, the bumps of your tongue are called papillae. And on the sides, so what you're looking at is the epithelium of a papilla. And um, the taste buds are going to be opened up to a pore. This is called a taste pore. And a taste bud is going to have support cells as well as receptor cells. So these are gonna be chemoreceptors, right? They're gonna detect the different chemicals in your food and um, so your food has to be dissolved in saliva. It has to be in liquid in order for you to taste it because it has to be dissolved in water in order to reach these uh, microvilli of your um, receptor cells inside the taste pore. So saliva is very important. Um, and then for our taste buds, we have these chemoreceptors and each taste bud can actually have a mix of different chemoreceptors the chemoreceptors are not going to be all or none. They have some um, crossover with what they can detect. They're just going to be more sensitive to some tastes than others. Um, but we do have five primary tastes, which are sour uh, due to um, hydrogen ions, which is your acid, right? And then salty due to sodium ions, sweet 
is due to sugars binding to the um, a ligand, right? Binding to the receptors. Um, bitter is going to be uh, stimulated by mainly plant alkaloids, chemicals um, made by plants, and those alkaloids are most of the time may, made so they prevent animals from eating the plants because they taste bad, bitter. And then umami, which is uh, going to be activated by glutamate, and that gives you the savory, meaty flavor that meat and also mushrooms have. Um, and we probably all know that taste works with smell. So this is a cartoon with um, taste and smell. It says, hey, tongue, did you know that smell contributes significantly to brain's perception of taste? And then you can, <laughs> that's preposterous. I'm the master of culinary destiny. You're just a snot peddler. I work alone, nose, gather your mucus and leave me be. And then he says, hey, tongue, what? I smell pizza. And then he says, I'm sorry I disturbed you. Yes, you smell. So smell is going to be the most um, predominant way that your perception of taste is going to be um, interpreted. Without smell, food does not taste like normal food, right? When you're sick and your sense of smell is knocked out, your food just doesn't taste good anymore. It tastes bland. With coronavirus, this is a virus that also you can lose your sense of smell and therefore your foods are going to taste really awful and bland. Um, so another thing to think about also is that all of your senses are holistic, um, are holistic, meaning that all your senses come into the brain and your brain sets up a perception. So taste is no different. T taste not only the smell of food and the taste of food on your tongue, but also the texture, like the touch receptors in your mouth are going to play a role in how food tastes, even thermoreceptors if a food is hot and spicy, but also how food looks appear, appears to you. So your eyes will indicate, you know, set up the brain to perceive the taste a certain way. And um, even the crunch and or the sound that it makes when you're eating it will help you inform your perception of taste. So food might taste really good uh, or better than it should be because it's presented to you maybe in a fancy restaurant and it's really beautifully plated and it's bright colors. And so your anticipation is that you're gonna, it's gonna taste good and it might just taste better. Um, or the food can come in a styrofoam box and you know it's the guacamole has turned brown and then it's gonna just taste bad to you because all those sensory systems have set up your brain to perceive the taste as bad. Um, anyhow, just a little um, introduction to that. So moving on to your sense of smell. Oh, the signal transduction in taste, right? So I didn't, I missed that, but it's just basically that you have chemoreceptors on your taste buds and when there's binding at the receptors in, this, in the microvilli there, you're going to get um, the intracellular calcium levels to rise. So you have a receptor um, it's a, a ligand gated um, or ion gated channel. It's going to cause an action potential. I'm sorry, a graded potential leading to um, an action potential in your afferent neurons. So this is going to be the graded potential. And then we have an action potential here. All right, moving on to smell. So olfaction, um, you have a region in the upper nasal cavity called the olfactory epithelium. This is going to contain um, different cells. So it's going to contain your receptor cell, which is going to have the stereocilia or the cilia with chemoreceptors. So again, this is a chemoreceptor. And um, then you're going to also have these basal cells. Basal cells are going to be stem cells. So this is um, a very awesome um, discovery that you know these receptor cells can replace themselves because we have these basal stem cells that can replace dead neurons. We also have a lot of support cells or sustentacular cells that can maintain the extracellular environment. Um, so we know that your nasal cavity is constantly making mucus. So you're going to have a mucus layer that's going to be covering up the um, cilia that have the receptors. So molecules that are in the air, if they are hydrophilic, they can go through the mucus and bind to the receptors. But if they're hydrophobic, they need help. And so there are actually little molecules called um, olfactory binding proteins, right? So I might put a little X here 
there might be olfactory binding proteins they're going to help shuttle those hydrophobic um, substances that may not be able to diffuse in the mucus and they'll shuttle them over to the um, the receptors um, so um, I think I got everything there. So yeah, the airborne chemicals must dissolve, must be dissolved in the mucus because your stereos, your cilia here, so I keep on saying stereocilia, your cilia here are embedded in the mucus, which is, it's going to be proteins and it's also going to be water. Then we know that we have um, binding and then a graded potential can be created here. Um, and then we're going to, um, uh, travel up, sorry in through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Remember these holes are called olfactory foramina. And um, this will then become the um, olfactory bulb. And then we're going to become the olfactory tract and go into the brain. So the signals um, are going to be uh, G protein coupled receptors and the fact that we can smell up to 10,000 different odors does not mean we have 10,000 different kinds of receptors. In fact, we have about 400 olfactory receptor types. So it works the same way that color vision kind of works where you have a pattern of um, excitation of different neurons and that will be interpreted as different smells. Um, so it uh, basically activates a G protein in the membranes called GOLF um, and then it activates adenylate cyclase, and then it binds to cation channels, opening them, and then you're going to depolarize the cell. So that is our sense of smell. And we're done. <laughs>